the format is a, is a conversation um, with um, Dr. Catherine Wright, the CEO of Cullum St. Gabriel Trust. Um, and then joining the conversation in the panel, um, we have uh, Steve Chalk from Oasis Trust, Dr. Martha Shaw from the London South Bank University, and Dr. Lois Lee from the University of Kent. And for all of the journalists on the call, uh, you're very welcome to put a question. Just jump in. Um, you can announce your, yourself in the chat box, but otherwise we will just come to you in person for a question. So there's the formalities out of the way. So, um, Catherine, hello and welcome. I know that you're no stranger to the Ridge Media Centre and we're very pleased to, to welcome you today. Uh, we, we've invited you because this weekend you've got a, a big event that you're running called our exchange or Rex exchange, you can tell us how it's pronounced, um, where you're going to introduce teachers to lots of research that's uh, going on at the moment in the area of uh, uh, religion and worldviews. And we'll give you a chance to talk to us about that and, and why you're doing it. But I wonder, because a, a lot of um, it seems to me as a lay person of what goes on in the arena of religious education is quite codified. Um, and so I wonder if you could kind of take us back to the basics. Um, your event at the weekend will be on religion and worldviews. This is the latest way of describing what is going on in, in the classroom. Can you just for the uninitiated explain to us what religion and worldviews means? Okay, yeah, certainly. Thank you, um, Ruth, so much for inviting me to this session um, this afternoon. Um, it's brilliant to be with you all, and uh, please do ask questions. Um, I'd be really happy to try and answer as many as I can later. So, religion and worldviews, yes. Um, so, just a little bit of background to explain it, first of all, might be helpful. So, uh, many of you will know that um, up until fairly recently, um, religious education has been referred to uh, in schools or RE it's often shortened to, hence why um, the pronunciation Ruth is RE exchange is what we're, we're calling it. Um, and so we're still using that at the moment. But in 2018, um, the RE Council commissioned uh, a report um, and a commission took place um, for a couple of years and the report came out in 2018 and it's called the Commission on RE and you can access that uh, online perhaps later I can put a link uh, in the chat to it and in that report um, a new vision for the subject is put forward um, where they call for a name change to religion and world views. Now, um, it's quite important to note uh, that religion is in the singular. So what's meant by that um, is, if you like, the category of religion. What do we mean by religion as, as a concept, um, as an idea? Um, and then worldviews. So by worldviews, um, I won't try and, and define it succinctly. There's lots of other people that could do that far better uh, than me. Um, but basically, it's um, the way people live their life. So it's, it's it's more than uh, belief, which is often a cerebral uh, kind of outworking um, of um, a religious and non-religious worldviews. Um, so it's more than that. It's kind of um, what makes people tick, why they do uh, what they do. Um, and so in terms of the subject itself, I think there are um, kind of four things in particular that we might consider in terms of what an education in religion and worldviews might look like. So first of all, what, what religion is and what worldviews are. So actually getting pupils to really explore those two things um, and how they're studied as well. So there are different ways of being able to study um, religion and worldviews. So you might take um, a, a more theological approach or a philosophical approach or historical or anthropological approach to study. So helping pupils understand that there are those different ways of studying uh, this subject. And then looking at the impact of religious, non-religious worldviews, their diversity, language practices um, are all part um, are of the study of this subject. So the phrase religion and worldviews is a kind of a new way of thinking about, about the subject. Um, does that, does, that, does that help? It, it, does, it does help. Um, but when the, when the Commission came out with a report, it was rejected by the government. Um, one of the reasons they gave was that it, it diluted what religion was. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you're still using the, the phrase. Is it commonly used uh, amongst teachers? Have they kind of ignored what the government said on that occasion? Okay, so um, I think the the government um, uh, kind of it was more a kind of a sense of um, 
not wanting to do anything at that particular time, I think I would say, rather than kind of um, blank sort of rejection, I suppose. Um, but also, I think there's a, a bit of a misnomer about the change of um, uh, phrase from RE to religion and worldviews, um, because it's about a complete shift of thinking about the subject. Uh, so it's certainly not diluting um, any sense of studying religion. Um, in fact, it's more important to be uh, to study religious and non-religious worldviews. And that's already happening now, actually, in the vast majority of schools. Um, uh, pupils are studying religious and non-religious worldviews as part of that. What this ch uh, name chain does is to kind of, in a sense, endorse that. It's, it's kind of been a, uh, an organic change, I suppose. And this is saying, yes, this is the right way forward. We need to rethink um, what this subject looks like. Um, at the, this event that you're organising at the weekend is to introduce teachers to research in the area. So first that begs the question, how confident are you that teachers who teach RE know what they're talking about? It's <laughs> uh, a great question, uh, Ruth. Um, very confident that they know what they're talking about, largely, I'm sure. Um, but I think there's in any subject, research is important and not, not just in education either. Um, constantly research is taking place so that we can be as well informed as possible um, about changing dynamics, um, about changing knowledge that people are gaining, new ways of doing things and so on. So um, yes, teachers uh, and lots of teachers actually are really engaged with research already. Um, we are partnering with a number of organisations um, for the event on Saturday. Today, and one of those is the Charter College, and they've been doing a lot of work um, already in engaging teachers with research, including research um, related to RE, but, but broader research around um, teaching and learning, around pedagogy, um, around subject knowledge, um, and so on. So yes, I think teachers are already doing a good job and are, are well informed. What we're trying to do is to help them to do that even better than they are at the moment. And I'm wondering whether this change um, within your whole profession about the way religion is um, described and, um, and taught in schools is something to do with the kind of lack of interest in religious education. I mean, various reports that um, actually schools are disobeying the law, they're, they're not making it compulsory, and often it's not taught above the age of 14, that was some research I saw. Um, is that what's behind this move to kind of change the way that it's considered, that you think that the old way of looking at religious education was turning teachers off, turning schools off, turning children off, and you had to make it, make it more relevant for today's society? Um, I think it's probably a mixture of things, um, Ruth. So I, I don't think it's the primary reason for, if you like, changing the name um, of the subject. Um, I think that's uh, primarily about a whole shift in thinking about the subject more widely, which, yes, does pull on um, uh, how people perceive religious and non-religious worldviews, I think, and perhaps religion in, in particular. Um, but actually, I think the, 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 the um, change of the name um, is much bigger than just thinking about um, it being kind of relevant. Um, but helping people understand the nature of, um, of religion in particular and uh, more widely worldviews views in terms of public perception is clearly important and really, really needed. So if by changing the name that helps uh, people understand what it is that we're looking at in schools, then I think that's actually really helpful um, for people to, to understand and see. But I, I don't think it's the reason for the, for the name change, but actually I think it may well help um, to achieve that. It could be one, one contributing factor. So in your... Um, uh... RE exchange event that's happening this weekend. You, your, your purpose, is, as I can see, it, is to introduce teachers to various areas of research that might help them in their work. One of the things that leapt out at me was um, that this whole area of science and religion, because it's funded by the Templeton uh, Foundation, which is very keen on, isn't it, on the interplay between science and religion at the moment. But the particular area um, of um, understanding COVID-19 and you you mentioned one of the documents that you're quite interested to see how different subject disciplines are coming together in their understanding of how to teach children about this. I wonder if you might be able to kind of talk about that a bit more and the examples that you've seen, the initiatives that you've seen perhaps. 
Yeah, so I think there's there's a couple of things there, um, Ruth. So first of all, in terms of how teachers are te or have been teaching the subject, particularly when we were in lockdown and they were teaching um, uh, religion and worldviews um, virtually like we are now or sending work home and, and so on to pupils, um, there were huge challenges um, and there was a lot of sharing of different resources and materials. So um, NATRE, National Association of Teachers of RE in particular, uh, put out a lot of um, guidance and help and support, um, as well as individual um, schools um, working in, uh, on things and sharing things and so on. But actually engaging pupils in discussion and conversation um, uh, virtually, um, particularly when many were not able to use something like we're using now, where we can all have a conversation in a few minutes, but where pupils were generally doing work by themselves at home, engaging in discussion of things was really challenging. So a number of them have been, a number of teachers have been thinking in and around around that um, we've got um, a couple of blogs on our own um, re online website uh, for example uh, where teachers talk about what they have been doing during covid um, in terms of teachers um, i think there's another really interesting dimension to this in that since march um, we've seen that certainly as a trust um, teachers giving more time to actually um, collaborating with one another virtually and engaging with research virtually as well. I'm not sure uh, if Martha and Lois uh, have seen this as well in, in their work, where teachers are, are giving up time to attend webinars, attend seminars, to uh, engage with, um, if you like, academics talking about subject knowledge. There was a whole series, for example, um, from the University of Chester on subject knowledge aspects, particularly links to GCC and A-level, that lots of teachers took part in. So I think um, there's two elements to this. I think there's been some opportunities um, during this time as well for teachers to become more engaged with research because they've seen it easier to do it in on this kind of platform. Um, so we've run events where vast numbers have, uh, have attended more than we could have imagined, um, which means that people can then actually have conversations with researchers directly. I, I don't know how close you are to the kind of... Um classroom level now in 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 your work I know you obviously you were a classroom teacher until all, all this happened but from the anecdotes that you're being told what, is it possible to answer this question what are the questions that teenagers are asking uh, what well, all children are asking in the classroom and how do religious education teachers get involved in that discussion okay um not so sure on that one, Ruth, because I'm not um, uh, so engaged um, with the classroom. In fact, I'm, I'm sure if um, Steve might have some examples that he can he can refer to in particular, um, perhaps. Um, but um, I think it will vary from school to school um, in terms of the sort of questions. Um, but certainly, um, young people are asking questions, um, you know, about a kind of purpose and, and about um, their. Uh, kind of what they're going to do in the future and all of those kind of questions I mean certainly on from a personal point of view those are the kind of questions that my own you know teenagers um, are asking you know how is this going to impact on me in the future and those kind of questions um, which I suppose you know are kind of tied up with people's own personal worldviews as well I imagine. Mm, thank you thanks very much Catherine okay. great introduction I wonder Steve perhaps we can turn to you next I saw you uh writing away so hopefully you have some thoughts but there are various things that I think that it would be great to get your insight on just picking up from what Catherine said the experience in the on the on the cold face if you like in the classroom of how um RE teachers in particular are getting involved in um, concerns about COVID, but generally what you think about the introduction of religion and worldviews and how that's bedding down in the curriculum in the schools that you have close association with. Yeah, thank you Ruth, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, um, we can. What I, th I think the thing is, um, and then this is, is very much in line with what Catherine's just said, um, if you were to ask me, if you'd have ever asked me, uh, through you know the last couple of decades what religion is I would say it's a worldview and um, what is Christianity it's a worldview what is atheism humanism oh they're worldviews what's communism it's a worldview and so in for us this change makes a huge amount of sense and in actual fact worldviews 
have to do with religion anyway, even if it's a godless religion, because of course, um, we all know that the, the word religion itself um, comes from the Latin, which means ligament, to re-ligament, to reconnect, to reconnect ourselves with ourselves and to reconnect ourselves with one another in community. And then of course, for um, some religions, for Christianity and others, there's that transcendent bit, reconnecting ourselves with, with God. And I think that has been the approach that we've taken, uh, is embedding into Oasis schools. What we uh, do, we're quite interesting probably as, um, as what often gets called a, a group of 53 um, faith schools, um, in actual fact, we're not faith schools, we're community schools, we serve everyone, so we don't have an admissions policy that favours the children of churchgoers over children who are, of parents who go to a mosque over uh, the children of atheists. Through the year, with each academic year, we start with a month where we look at who am I, and then a month where we look at together how to become the best version of myself. And then we work through and be joyful to be humble, to be honest, etc. So our RE curriculum is based into that. Our whole curriculum is fed through that lens. Our assemblies are fed through that lens. We don't sing hymns except in assemblies. Um, I, I went to a school where I, I uh, sang a hymn every day you know, and uh, had a religious assembly every day. And all I can say is it put at least 96% of the kids that were involved in the exercise off any religion forever. Um, so what we've uh, attempted to do is integrate this into life. And when it comes to our awards evenings at the end of the year, as well as giving prizes for history and geography, we give prizes based around these nine habits of Oasis. So in that sense, this whole question that Catherine's been exploring, you know, what makes you tick? What gives you your values? Where is your vision for, for life is informed by uh, is in, informed by the fruit of the spirit as recorded in the book of Galatians. So what is the what is the impact on the children and how has this curriculum changed lives? Um, it's an extraordinary impact, actually. Um, so the, the, the first thing to say is this is for our school's chief executive. It's for our school's central staff, it's for the finance department, the HR department, the IT department. It's also for uh, the heads of our schools and all of the staff. Each week, each week in every staff room, uh, on one of the week, there'll be a session um, uh, for all staff around this, and then it's, it trickles down, if you like. It, in terms of our central organising, it's worth saying that like all uh, big organisations, we've got a finance team centrally and regionally. We have an HR team, we have a governance team, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we also have what we call a theology and ethos team. And that theology and ethos team, it sits centrally, it works regionally, and all of our inductions, whether you come as a, as, as a, a, a head teacher or you come as an, a teaching assistant, or you come to work on our school dinners team, everyone gets the same induction and everybody actively works at this thing. And it does produce incredible uh, results because we've been at this for 10 years now. Um, and so this has been researched by others uh, more widely and is just about to be researched again. But what you find, and this is, a, is an interesting distinction, and perhaps this again comes to this term religion and, and worldviews, You'll find young people who, who, who really pick up on these habits in relationship to the Christian faith, they inquire, or in relationship to their uh, Muslim faith. We work in some hugely, um, predominantly Islamic areas, etc. But others will just pick up on them as human traits. So I don't believe in God, they say, but actually I'm learning about being joyful and humble and honest, and compassionate, considerate, and forgiving. Um, and we 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 have uh, we've been at this long enough now to have many kids who who've who've left our schools and they write to us constantly about the things that they're doing and how they're building these habits into uh, their professional and personal lives. 
Have you spoken to the government about all of this, Steve? I'm wondering if it's been so beneficial to society, why it hasn't caught on in every school? Uh, well, I don't know the answer to that. I think there's a huge, I can only speak as a church leader at this point. I think there's a huge, there's a huge question for the church to ask about its relevance to society. So I, again, I went to a school where every day we showed up in a hall, there was a cross on the front wall, we uh, had a prayer and a hymn and a talk, and I have to say it was utterly meaningless to me um, and, and to my friends. And so I suppose it is in reaction to that kind of Christianity, which, which is about formalities and rituals, but wasn't at least connecting with us that, that uh, we developed this. This has been researched by the Jerusalem Trust and, and many others. And in actual fact, we've been employed to share what we've learned because it's, it's well researched, well written about. We've got full time staff work on this every single day, what they do uh, within Oasis, how we develop this further. Um, but I think it goes to the question of. Uh, it, I'd express this in terms of Christianity. What is Christianity? When Jesus said, I am the way, truth, the life, what, what, what's our interpretation of that? For me, I would say, Jesus was saying, live this way. These are values worth embedding in your life. Walk in this way. It's a fulfilling way to live, rather than what we often think about as religion, which is a, a particular set of beliefs and showing up in a church on a, on a Sunday. I say that all as the church leader. Yeah. I know we've got um, some um, people on the call from other faiths. It'd be interesting to get their take, but I, I've heard that from uh, you know colleagues who are, are Muslim and Baha'i and all kinds of faith traditions would express it in the same way, uh, Steve. Thank you. Um, I, I think, can we go to Lois Lee next? Because I know Lois can't stay for the whole thing. And after that, perhaps we can take a question from a journalist and then come to you, Martha. So Lois, I wonder if I could ask you for your reflections and, and particularly perhaps how this plays out in your area of uh, life, which is higher education. Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Sorry to not be able to join you for the whole uh, discussion. It's it's really fascinating and helpful. The, all of the issues we're talking about today are hugely dynamic uh, concerns in the practical sense of um, those of us teaching in religious studies contexts who are reflecting on the nature of and the definition of our subject in exactly the same ways. There's a very close symbiosis at the moment, as Catherine was saying, between what's going on at RE and what's going on at religious studies, which I think is to the mutual benefit of both. Um, it's, I may be in a way slightly more pessimistic about where we're at in terms of understanding some of these key terms than Catherine. I think there is a bit of lack of clarity around this core term, but that's because it's so cutting edge. There's so much going on. Um, and I certainly agree that there has been really close connections between lots of RE teachers and researchers which has been really wonderful to see we yeah, also had a web webinar series at the University of Kent that was very well attended by RE teachers and trainers and practitioners and so on and I think that is necessary um, because it is uh, quite an important and profound shift in thinking that's going on um, that has kind of real substance to it and this sense of what are we talking about um, Catherine used the phrase the way people live their lives but it's, at some points that sometimes strays into kind of broader anthropological thinking about our ways of life and so on. So working out what those boundaries are and what would make sense in the RE or indeed the RS classroom and what doesn't make sense, what should be in other areas is a big part of this um, discussion and debate um, is ever changing. I mean, I think I tend to think, think about worldviews as concerning what how people conceive of what life is and how those conceptions, which may be intellectual, but they may be really embodied in part of their ritual life or their relationships, they don't necessarily need to be operating on that level. But the way they kind of conceive of what life is changes how they live their lives. So it's a slightly more sort of specific um, idea in my mind. It's, it's about those kind of existential and metaphysical um, issues. And in that sense, picking up on the word Steve used, it, it's always about the transcendent, though it may not be about a belief in there being a transcendent realm. But um, I love the sociologist Georg Simmel said, um, you know, by knowing of our finitude, by knowing of our mortality, we therefore transcend it. So that sense of transcendence 
transcendence that there's something kind of perhaps unique to humans perhaps not who knows but certainly true of humans that we have this kind of insight into life that people respond to in all of the diverse ways Catherine's talking about and is fundamental in in the classroom um, and I do think the the pull, the factor that we have so many young people identifying as non-religious has to be kind of key in thinking about where the, the disciplines go next. And, you know, at the moment, the latest data is 70 um, percent of 15 to 24 year olds identify as having no religion. So this is a huge huge number of young people who identify in this way and I think at that point you do have to foresee one of two things either the concept of religion becomes less and less interesting or it only becomes interesting to people as something that other people do and you know becomes thought of as exotic and perhaps weird and perhaps dangerous and you know all of those ways of thinking about religion and either disappears or gets treated in this very particular way or you do you benefit from what's going on at the moment you you notice these crucial aspects of human life that the non-religious have in ways that are totally analogous not the same as but totally analogous to religious ways of life and I think that's something that research has definitely backed up and you keep that space so it's sort of are we reformed in this way or I think a sort of slow and steady decline of, I mean, Catherine's pointed at some of the challenges that are already underway. So I think it's really, really exciting. I think it's really crucial. And I think it's absolutely in keeping with both research knowledge, but also social changes that are going on. So you, you mentioned 70% of young people are non-religious. And um, just to pick you up on that just quickly, Lewis, can you, don't want to put you on the spot, can you point to the research that came from that oh, figure? Yes. Sorry, yes, of course. Um, it's the British Social Attitudes Survey. So that's just that's annually uh, annual figures. And that was the latest figures. That's from 2000. The survey was done in 2018. It takes takes right. us a while to process all those data and so on. Right. But yeah. So just to, to ask you um, uh, a question specific to your uh, area of work, universities. Um, are you finding that this um, discussion that's going on about uh, reframing what religion is and how it studies is crucial to the survival of uh, the study of religion at university level? Because we heard some reports in, uh, in, in, the, in the summer term that certain university departments may close down because students weren't going forward to, to study it. Just tell us about the discussions that are going on in higher education and the, and the crucial nature of them for the survival of the subject. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variety because uh, university departments have quite different profiles. So there are some religious studies departments that are very established as also theological training and so on. So by uh, at higher education level, there are kind of expertise that go on within particular departments that vary their outcomes. But I think overall, there is a strong concern across HE about how religious studies is valued as a subject by students coming to it. And of course, those ideas about religious studies are grounded in their experience in the classroom. So that's another reason why that kind of symbiosis, those conversations between school level education and higher, um, higher education are so important. What we, what anecdotally, what I've always found in teaching in this context is we have a huge interest, a much broader interest when we offer subjects as um, electives and to some extent joint honours as well, because the interest is there, but that identity I, you know, someone thinking it will be valuable for me to have a religious studies degree. That's the story I want to tell about myself. That's what I'm about. That is becoming less and less popular with those identity shifts over time. So there's always been that frustration that I think the interest is there, but um, certainly a sense of what the degree is and maybe a poor understanding of what the degree is, is mm. a challenge. And I think an increasing one. Thank, thank you, Lois. I would like to turn to Martha then next um, and just broaden this discussion out a bit, Martha, because the, um, the discussion that we've just been having about religious literacy, how, why it's important to understand worldviews, to understand the kind of concept of religion, um, hits us in the media as well. Um, you know, why, why is it important for journalists and the media generally to um, understand what religion is and to have a working knowledge of religion and society in order to do their job? I wonder if I could just ask you to broaden out the, the, the discussion and take us to your area of research, religion and society, please. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, just sort of, I think, 
sort of going back a step, really, um, when you're asking about the, the questions that pupils are asking about religion or about <clears throat> um, worldviews in society, I think, you know, these are the kind of questions that uh, pertain throughout life that everyone's asking. And certainly, I mean, what I think the new religion and worldviews um, national um, plan and national entitlement really speaks, why I think it's so important is that it really speaks to some of those questions. And um, so going back to research that um, I conducted um, a few years back now on around schools in England, asking students, teachers, parents, what it was that they felt children or school leavers needed to know and understand about religion or worldviews. And, and a lot of that was about the day-to-day, -day, the lived reality of let's say worldviews um, for people on a day-to-day -day basis. So how it impacts on their, their, their workplace, what kinds of issues come up in the workplace. But, um, but also, so it's this idea of lived religion, you know, how is it embodied, lived, experienced by the individual on a day-to-day -day basis? And then a lot of that is down to interpretation. Um, so, you know, this idea that uh, uh, worldviews are not fixed, you know, they're not sort of, they're interpretable. So looking, at, yes, at diversity within traditions, but um, also how they are um, interpreted on a day-to-day -day basis and how, in, in, in that sense, that they are also fluid, that they are changing. So this idea of traditions in transition. Um, and all of those questions, I think, kind of are about the lived, about lived religion. And they are, they're the kind of questions that are interesting to students to, to pupils, you know, but what does it mean to be a Christian? But how come, and this is linked to, I think, the, um, the issue of the term, the category religion, and how religion is represented um, in the media, but also elsewhere, is this, this, what we found a lot of was, particularly from pupils, was, but how come, you know, what we read about in our textbooks about religion, that, that's not what so-and-so believes, or that's not what so-and-so does, that, you know, that doesn't, doesn't match, there's a mismatch here. And a lot of that was around, for example, questions of controversy. So how, you know, images of, for example, particularly um, Islam they've seen in the media at the time, um, you know, and questions around sexuality and religion. And, you know, these are the kinds of, it's the real lived reality of religion for individuals on a day-to-day -day basis, how it also intersects with um, Sort of political issues and um, on the local global context as well. These these are the kinds of questions that the students are really interested in, and I think a real value of the um, national the new proposed national entitlement is that it gets to grips with these, and it you know there is a focus on lived religion. There's a focus on religion as um, in, in, as interpretation, um, which I think is really really important and. The other thing that I think is really important in that is the, the retention of the term religion in the title. And I know there's, there's massive, you know, there's always going to be debates over terminology it's, and it can go on forever. And sometimes it's a very unhelpful distraction from what matters. But um, I do think that the focus on the term religion has an important presence there because it denotes that, you know, as a concept, it's worthy of study in its own right. Um, we need to look at what we mean by religion, what, and this links to the, the construction of knowledge, you know, how these representations, for example, in the media or in a lot of traditional RE textbooks, you know, how these are a construction and why they might not match with react some of the lived reality, because it's a construction. And I think we do need part, a really key part of what goes on in the classroom for me is that deconstruction of the knowledge we have around religion. And I think that's, not sure I really answered your question here, sorry, but I think it, this links to, you know, for, for journalists, for anybody, um, you know, dealing with representations of religion, I think it's a really important part of that is to, to look at those and where they come from and what the frame is. Hmm. Well, welcome, welcome to our world. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and if you take a look at our kind of daily news briefings, the, the stories that are selected, which are about religion and society, is quite interesting. I'd be very interested to get your reflections on that if you want to start a conversation afterwards. But thank you, Martha. Can I just go to Andrew Brown now, who uh, one of the journalists on the call to ask a question, Andrew, please. I'm interested in whether you think the object of this education should be to make the pupils think about their own positions 
and how necessary it is to get away from what I think perhaps unfairly is the, the BBC tradition of, look, here are all these interesting religions. This is what Sikhs believe. This is what Jains believe. This is what Christians believe, etc., with no linkage at all to the way these are actually understood from the inside and worked out in lives. I was fascinated by what Steve Chalk was saying about you put these life principles and then, you know, you, you work towards the theology from the way that your life works rather than the other way around. Um, I, I say this partly because um, from long experience at The Guardian, I know that religion is a completely toxic brand. I mean, as a word, it just turns people right off. Religion is something other people do. And when you fall into that mindset, you're completely, uh, you're doomed to reinvent it badly yourself so the perspective should come from the student trying to make sense of their lived experience yes or, or, yeah or from a, a someone else's analysis of society well, which, I, yeah. i'm really asking whether the object is to make the student understand their own experience rather than to give them a sort of box ticking understanding of what other people are supposed to think i would claim coming from my theology that god grants to each one of us freedom um freedom of expression freedom of thought i think the church I speak for the don't know if i can speak for the whole church but i think the church has spent a lot of time trying to push and bully and co coerce people into holding specific religious opinions this is the truth mm -hmm. um, in the church that i lead in central london we we often say that a good sermon isn't one where you that you necessarily agree with and it's not one where you go oh that was a great joke or a good illustration it's one that creates a debate a discussion that you can't wait to carry on you may fundamentally disagree with everything you've heard because these are just opinions so we'll teach constantly throughout the life of oasis that life is a debate and theology and philosophy which are the same thing are debates and i realize there'll be um, academics here say oh, hang on a minute philosophy and theology aren't the same thing i understand that opinion but i think in reality again people choose um a worldview and so what we're aiming to do through all our education in every classroom and in the the wider community work we do as well is just to get people to think and i wholeheartedly agree with what lois said that in the end this brings you to the transcendent. Um, you know, Jesus said, uh, love God and love your neighbor the way you love yourself. There's a long tradition with it in Christian thought, um, dating right back to the Desert Fathers in the third century of beginning backwards, learning to love yourself, which then leads you to a love for others. It's hard to love others if you don't love yourself, which then in a linear sense leads you on to love for God but by the time you've learned to love yourself and learn to love others you realize that it's not a linear progression it's all transcendent I think this is at the heart of AA and other uh, agencies helping people with their addictions the higher power principle so I think that if you get people thinking about life then in actual fact they end up forming theological opinions which may be the same as yours or might be different our job is to create debate anyone else want to chip in thanks steve could i before i have to disappear i'm afraid yeah. to jump in um yeah it's a great question um i think from my experience of working with teachers and uh, people at re council who are working so hard to develop these curriculum recommendations this issue is really being very carefully thought through um, to get that balance between That's learning really subject knowledge and that kind of individual experience um, and the way that fits in with different philosophies of education and so on and that's that you know much more advanced conversation than I could speak to at all it's been really amazing to kind of uh, engage with that but I think there's clearly a concern about that balance and where and those both aspects being really crucial to a kind of um, very successful uh, redeveloped RE curriculum but I was also heartened by the focus in the um, core report on social sciences so they're very interested in working closely with social scientific data to understand religion and that becomes really important again balanced out with 
the classical teaching of you know getting to know the the great books of religions and so on and so forth but it becomes increasingly important when lots of people's worldviews are developed outside of those formal frameworks um, and there's no better way to find out what's going on in their lived lives um, than through social sciences so I think that's an important part of the recommendations that have been um, been made and finally I'll just say that I think an, an inclusive approach to the study of religion or the study of worldviews has the effect of engaging students in terms of their personal development anyway because it's much clearer that they have a personal stake in those subjects and that's true as it you know of history of geography now everyone if I go into the history classroom I might not be asked to situate myself and do a testimony you know narrative of how I fit into a particular history but I'm being constantly having a sense of and being helped to understand that my existence is shaped by that history and that I have a stake in it and with those shifts of identity it's been harder to make that clear in the RE classroom to those students who don't identify in that way so I think being able to really be clear with our students about the stake they have in the subject helps do exactly what you're talking about uh, Andrew. Can I, can I just kick in as well Ruth just very quickly I just wanted to reiterate what Lois has said because I totally agree with that um, and I think um, one of the key things uh, going forward that, that certainly is having a lot of discussion you're right uh, Lois um, at, in, at the RE Council is this idea of positionality is that everyone comes from a position all of us sitting here now in this virtual space we all come from a particular position um, and when we look at uh, a piece of text or a picture or whatever it might be um, that uh, that thing it kind of is inert until we connect with it and there is a relationship between us um, and whatever it is that we're studying and I think that you're right there's more work to be done on what uh, what that actually looks like um, and what that means in terms of religion and worldviews um, but the other thing I just wanted to pick up as well that you you said was this whole idea of that uh, the change of the name is more inclusive in nature so that everybody feels that they yeah they've got a kind of a stake um, in the subject um, so acknowledging that everyone has a position that they are bringing to it um, uh, whatever it is that they're studying and looking at and by looking at a new piece of knowledge you are transformed by that even if it's just that you've got some more knowledge than you had previously, um, you've gained something through that. Um, so um, I'm not sure if that's helpful, Andrew, but I, I think this whole idea of kind of positioning is, is going to be increasingly important. And just to pick up something from the chat box, um, Caroline has asked, um, her experience of resistance to religious education is that it is perceived as either trying to indoctrinate children into a faith, or, uh, or, or is it encouraging children to challenge their own faith background? How do teachers navigate this? Catherine, I think that's for you. How do teachers navigate that? Yes, well, I think, um, well, it's all part of kind of educating um, about what the purpose of the subject actually is. So I'm just so I'm just rereading the, the, the text. So my experience of resistance at Dari is that it's perceived as either trying to indoctrinate or encouraging to challenge. Um, yes, and it's a very um, difficult um, place to be. And having been an RE teacher in, in previous lives as well. Um, so I think it's understanding that actually RE is about neither of those things. Um, so again, it's about educating people. Um, I think if um, a teacher was being seen as kind of in, in, indoctrinating or, you know, that there was such a strong challenge to a particular background, then I think we would be concerned as educators that that was happening. Um, so it's, yeah. Hope my, my worry is that that you know that 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 would be going on. So I think it's um, a case of um, educating teachers to be able to show that actually um, clearly uh, the subject to religion and worldviews um, is not about indoctrination, and clearly it's not wanting to. Um, make a child or a young person feel uncomfortable by, by possibly having um, you know, their, their own worldview, not necessarily questioned, but challenged, critiqued. Um, I mean, certainly part of the subject is to kind of go into depth, to critique, to, yeah, possibly to challenge, um, but not in a way where anyone would become uncomfortable with that. Um, the Army Council actually does have a code of conduct for teachers, uh, uh, which they did produce in consultation with Natre that does try and help to navigate through these difficult questions. Um, and it is, yes, it's, it's not an easy subject to teach and to get those things right, I would say. Um, another question for you, Catherine, while you, you're there, and this is a question from Iftikhar. 
What was the consultation process for the new curriculum? I, I guess that you're referring to the Commission on RE. Yeah, so um, at the moment, um, to be clear, there isn't a new curriculum per se. So um, at the moment, each uh, local authority um, has a duty to produce what's called an agreed syllabus um, for religious education. Um, and academies can choose to um, follow a local agreed syllabus or produce something um, which is similar um, uh, in standards to, to what a local agreed syllabus is, is producing. I'm not sure what, what Steve does at, uh, with, at Oasis. Um, so there isn't a new curriculum per se, so just to make that really clear. What's put forward in the commission um, is a suggested um, statement of entitlement for all pupils, which um, uh, sets out the knowledge and understanding that we would want pupils to be able to have in, in this new subject. The, the consultation process for the commission was quite extensive. Um, uh, I can grab a commission off my shelf if you like, but it's um, there's a, you know there was wide consultation. There were um, uh, a couple of surveys were were sent out to all member organisations of the RE Council and beyond, um, and there were um, events that were held. Um, I suppose you could say sort of like interviews or focus groups and presentations, and that kind of thing took place as well. But it's also important to stress it's an ongoing process. Um, so um, uh, teachers um, and other professionals um, within the RE, uh, RE community are being engaged with not, um, still as we speak. Um, so it's not, it's, not an, it's not an end yet, if you like. So the commission, just to be, to be clear about this, uh, Catherine, the commission was rejected in 2018 by the then government. Is it still, a live document or is it going to come back again be re-edited so um just to reiterate although um the um re council had a, a letter uh stating that the um the the department at the time were not planning the government were not planning to take forward um the commission at that point it was kind of a um a sense of we don't want to do anything at the moment uh, rather than it being a complete line drawn underneath it so the commission recommendations are still very much live um and in fact um uh, there are as well as the whole area around religion and worldviews curriculum there is a lot of work being done in the background particularly around teacher education um, and wanting parity and those kind of areas. There's a, a pilot project um, on um, local advisory networks which um, are recommended in the um, report as well. So it's very much a live document um, and the RE Council and some of its very specific partners um, are looking at taking it further and moving things forward. So they have a development plan to kind of work through the recommendations with government. Thank you, Catherine. Right, another question from a journalist, this time Rosie, if you'd like to ask your question. Hi, uh, sorry if it's, I don't think this has been covered, but I have had to dip out and in and out a little bit, so forgive me if it has been. I mean, I, I think, you know, RE and worldviews, um, if we can't communicate something about the excitement of the sacred text, there's a you know, can, can we get anywhere? And I just wonder what your thoughts about that are, because um, I was interested when you're talking about sort of positionality, and it's it's not just the pupil and student's positionality, is it? It's the positionality of the people who created those texts and how those texts came together. And one of my real sadnesses in seeing my children go through GCSE RE was just how their school dealt with sacred texts. The Bible says this, not even this and this, which might be a bit different, or the Quran says this. And I, and I just remember the excitement of discovering when I was their age that, you know, there are four accounts of the same thing. And, you know, and what did they say about the position of the person who was writing them? And so I know you're really pressed with everything that has to go into that curriculum, but I just wonder how you make texts come alive to people so that they, they, they get it. And I they connect with it in a relationship. So Steve wants to come in here at this point. Well, I would say, you know, this is a, this is a study of hermeneutics, isn't it? And I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you say. We we talk about the Bible, uh, the, the Quran, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in this, you know, their, their, their authority cannot be challenged and questioned. Well, of course, every child is challenging the authority of everything. 
including the person who told them that you can't challenge the authority of the Quran or the Bible. And there's a, there's a very poor understanding of what the Bible is, for instance. So um, it's described as a book. In actual fact, it's a library. It's a library that's written by a host of authors with different worldviews, different outlooks, different politics, different characters, different values over at least 1,500 years. The laws of Moses were written in the middle of the Bronze Age. Um, Jesus contradicts the laws of the Moses, uh, more, laws of Moses. You've heard it was said in the middle of Bronze Age, but now moral consciousness has developed. And I'm telling you this. Um, so I, I think you're quite right, Rosie. We, when we say a text is sacred, what does that actually mean? And, I, you know, and it's no, that's my whole point. There's no point in telling kids this is sacred. Well, you might think it's sacred, we have to show them how this, this collection, in the case of the Bible, this, this ancient library, this collection of writings have become sacred to the church over the centuries and why the church believes they're sacred, but also how the moral debate has moved on beyond the New Testament. We don't believe the same thing about the role of women in society or the church or the same thing about slavery, et cetera, or LGBT inclusion, et cetera. So it's a journey. And again, this is the debate to engage kids in. And I think they're excited by that. Don't you think that, that doesn't that lead to all kinds of problems, Steve, though? Um, when you, you have um, children of very devout families, let's put it that way, in classrooms, who've been brought up to believe in the unerring uh, accuracy and rightness of a, of a text, how does a teacher cope with a complaint from a parent that you're leading them yeah. astray? Well, this is the problem with education generally, isn't it? You see, so uh, we would, we've been discussing how does uh, RE, the teaching of religion, challenge kids from fundamentalist backgrounds? Well, how does biology challenge them? Do you know, so we all know that there are many kids who grow up with a, you know, out, you know a, 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 who grow up with a six day uh, version of creation um, and a young earth theory and at the age of 13 or whenever it is, oh, it's earlier than that, isn't it? They sit in a biology classroom and they go, well, I can't marry these two worlds together because I've been taught Genesis chapter one is, is a scientific text um, and it happened like this and yet I'm taught this, what do I do? So at that point, they either throw out their religion or they ignore science, either, result is hardly beneficial so it's it's about the interpret the correct inter the serious interpretation of the bible will always lead you to a different place to its literal understanding 